So inshallah, assalamu alaikum everyone, jazakallah khair for joining. Um, I, we, my name is uh, Dr. Umar Tarkhan, I'm one of the GP from Manchester. Inshallah, I'll be uh, seeing you and talking to you more at the end of the webinar. But inshallah, we will start the webinar. It's a general instruction um, for while the webinar is running. So make sure you're muted and if you want to talk, raise your hand. And you can see certain signs on your side. And there is a hand raised. There is a screen sign, question sign. So if you go on a chat box, you can write down your questions. And inshallah, Allah, we will un try to get them answered by the panelists. Or if it is directly to the organizers, we will answer it and reply it to you. And maybe the whole pattern of the whole webinar is, inshallah, 45 minutes, there will be um, interactive a discussion with the panelists. And uh, um, each panelist will be given the chance to speak, inshallah, and you will be given a, ch a chance to ask questions at the end. If there is any burning question that can be asked in the middle, please raise your hand and um, uh, or text it or put it in the chat box. So that's the main uh, main thing, and the whole webinar it will be recorded, and uh, inshallah, and and if anybody who has actually requested to be sent it to them later, because many of us they are on uh, at work at the moment, so that can be inshallah done. So Jazakallah for joining, and I hand it over to Sadita who is sharing the this webinar. So inshallah, let's start with the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and then we keep running. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Just checking if uh, everyone can hear me. Wa alaikum assalam. Yes, we can hear you now. Jazakumullah Please carry on. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today um, for this very interesting session, Motherhood and Medicine. Um, Alhamdulillah, we're very honored to have uh, some experts in our uh, panel discussion today. Um, I will inshallah introduce um, everyone to you later on. Um, we, uh, this uh, topic, motherhood and medicine, has generated a lot of interest. Um, and as we shared um, about it on Facebook, on our Bima Facebook page, um, I think we we are um, um, we are assuming that we've got uh, people from um, not only from UK, from other parts of the world too. Um, so, talking about motherhood and medicine, the balance is hard and. Uh, I'm a uh, mother as well. Um, I'm, uh, I've got two kids, and I'm a GPST one, um, starting in February, inshallah. Um, we we all feel this tension um, as a mother uh, while we're working, and especially with our very demanding careers. So today we're going to ask our panel of experts about various things on this issue, um, and we're hoping uh, they're going to share their tips with us as how to treasure the time that um, we do have without being uh, bogged down in the never-ending to-do list. Um, so we're going to ask them about their creative strategies on getting on top of um, the overwhelm, really. Um, so I will introduce the speakers to you, um, but I just want to um, mention a hadith before uh, we start our panel discussion, inshallah. So why did we actually ch choose this topic? Um, I think as, as mothers um, and as working mothers when, uh, in a very demanding career, um, we, we hardly get any time um, to give to our families and we are so much busy with our professional development um, and with our uh, full-time jobs uh, that we really struggle to give quality time to our children. Um, well, we, um, as we read the Quran, we realize that children are a gift from Allah to us and um, the Quran has referred to children with the word wahabna, which means that Allah has gifted them to us. Um, and in other words, they, Allah has reminded us that our children are technically not ours. They have been gifted by Allah. And they are actually a trust from Allah. And we are made responsible by Allah to take care of them according um, to what pleases Allah. And not according to what pleases us or pleases society or culture. I was reading a hadith um, which really struck with me. Um, uh, this is a hadith that was uh, quoted in Bukhari and Muslim that uh, in which our Prophet, peace be upon him, tells us that each of you is a shepherd and each of you is responsible for his flock. The leader is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. A man is a shepherd of his family and is responsible for his flock. And a woman is a shepherd in the house of her husband and is responsible for her flock. And a servant is a shepherd of his master's wealth and is responsible for it. 
each of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. So as, as, my, as parents and as specifically as mothers, we have obligation and responsibilities towards our children and families. Um, there's also a, an ayah in the Quran from chapter 66, there's a verse number 6 that says, O you who believe, protect yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stones. So how do we protect ourselves um, and our families living in this um, era of trials and tribulations and when we are very uh, busy with our careers as well? Um, so inshallah we're going to have a panel discussion which will last about 45 minutes um, and then we'll have a question and answer session as Dr. Mtukhar mentioned in the end. Um, I will um, inshallah introduce um, our very esteemed guests with us today one by one um, and we'll take question side by side. Um, we've got, uh, among our panel of experts, we've got Dr. Aisha Janjua, um, who's a year six speciality training at Birmingham. I will tell you more about her, inshallah, as we're going to ask questions from, from her later on. Uh, we're also very honored to have Dr. Sabina Jamil, um, who is an associate dean for GP education. Um, and she's doing almost a superhuman number of things um, in her life. Uh, we're going to, she's going to share with us as well later on um, about some tips, how she manages with motherhood and medicine. Um, and finally, we've got Mrs. Sumaira Wasti. She's a part-time dentist and she's a mother of two. Um, so let me just introduce her briefly and I'm sure she will tell us more about herself, inshallah. Um, so Mrs. Sumaira Wasti, she's a part-time dentist. Um, she's a student of Arabic, Fiqh and Tafsir, mashallah. Uh, and she also teaches Tajweed. She works with uh, MEND, um, which is Muslim Engagement uh, and Development. Um, and I'm sure you must have heard all uh, about MEND. Um, and she works uh, regarding civic engagement. Um, she's also helped set up a youth organization for girls, mashallah. Um, and she's very active in the community. And she loves engaging with people from all walks of life. So, um, Mrs. Vasti, um, I'll take the first question from you. Um, alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we would really like to benefit from your experience, um, how you managed to do so much while being a mother yourself. Uh, my first question would be, how, um, why did you choose to study Quran sciences, Islamic studies and fiqh? I mean, how did you manage to accomplish this while, uh, while as a working mother, especially as a professional woman? Um, I think, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, um, you mentioned that we're a panel of experts. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert, and today I can only give you my subjective opinion about my life um, and experiences. Um, but going back to um, career and balancing motherhood and, and being and everything, um, basically what happened was that after working full-time for many years and you know falling pregnant and then going back uh, to work very, very part-time, um, I basically fell into, just happened to walk into some classes, which were the Jweed, um, started this journey of studying the Jweed seriously, academically, and then um, really actually loving it. And it was the, the love that it developed within myself of um, Quran and Ilm and Deen um, that really keeps me going. Great, mashallah. So, um, what I, I think we, uh, we've got a lot of junior doctors with us today um, and some um, other healthcare professionals who would like to know um, what are your ways of connecting your children with Quran and uh, what kind of relationship you want your children to have with Quran in future and what efforts do you do about it? Especially okay, when so you're working as well. Uh, the thing with them dentistry is why I chose dentistry is because it's very easy to part time in that and um, from going, to, from obviously you qualify uh, after five years of study and then after a year of training you can actually work as a general dental practitioner and when you're working with the GDP you can uh, have very flexible hours in terms of there's no you know, as long as I'm doing even one session a week, which is what I did. So when my children came along, I was actually just working half a day a week uh, while they were very, very young. And uh, because of that, I had a lot of spare time then. And even now, I only work one to three or four sessions maximum a week, which is why in the daytime, on the other day, weekdays, I have a lot more time to, um, to study myself. Regarding my children, um, I would say the essence always comes from, in terms of children's therapy uh, with respect to Islam, is that what they learn is not what I tell them to learn, but what they see me do. So whatever I love and love doing, inshallah, they also aspire to and love and love doing. Um, I would say that with uh, Quran, um, they do attend Quran classes, but it's nothing that I've kind of forced upon them. And they actually enjoy those. And um, 
I suppose when they see a parent or other people around them, they're in that environment where they've grown up with, that they're in these halafat of ilm and halafat of Qur'an, they automatically kind of have that uh, aspiration themselves, and so they actually enjoy doing this. The essence, I would say, is not necessarily, the, the crux of it is always that, um, you know, as Sheikh Hakim Nadawi said, if you want your, to do good thurbiya to your children, build their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they, and how do they build their love for Allah? They see you love Allah. So if they see you, um, you know, crying in your salah, or when you read, read Quran, it affects you, or, you know, you see something like, for example, it rains, we're driving down the road and it rains, and I say, oh, make dua, this is the time when, you know, du'as are accept, accepted more. Little things like this, if you're doing your du'as, entering in and out of the house, so it's basically, the essence is building their connection. And, you know, Quran is part of that, and Azkar is part of that, your salah is part of that, but it's your daily habits as well. Yes, very rightly so. You, you've mentioned that we are our children's first role models. Um, but as very busy professions, we're always busy with our work-related issues, training, e-portfolios, um, audits, etc. Um, and a never-ending to-do list um, uh, with house affairs. So how do you fit a Quran schedule for yourself um, in your daily routine? Um, so, well, with regards to my children, and they actually go out, out to a different teacher and, and uh, learn from her. Um, for myself, I attend my own uh, halakhat or Quran classes and hip, um, sorry, fiqh and other classes. So, if I'm only working sort of three or four sessions a week, I still have the other days in the week to kind of play with. And then, uh, other than that, um, I don't really have, I would say, my social life is not, so something has to give. Uh, and you have to decide on your list of priorities what gives then. And for me, I would say I don't socialize as much as maybe other people, but then I say to all my friends uh, that if I see you at various halaqa or various talk or whatever, you know, that's where I'll probably meet you. But I don't have a very, very busy or hectic social life, but that's just my choice. Um, it's up to you. You have to draw your list of priorities in life, and then, you know, nothing is. over others and something is going to have to give. Yes, indeed. Um, I believe your children are doing HIVs as well. Can you just tell us more about that and um, why did you choose that and um, how are your children doing with regards to HIVs? So they, they attend, the, uh, so, uh, the children actually go to or were at the um, junior school for Muslim children. My son's still there, my daughter's moved on now. but. The Quran teacher there was very, very good, mashallah, and because she lives just down the road, it's very convenient for me to send my children to her, and she's excellent, at, you know, with the children. Um, with the hifaz, I would say that um, basically, you know, whatever you teach your children now, we all know that their brains are like sponges, and they will absorb information so easily. Um, even when they're very young, and they don't necessarily understand a language properly, if you just teach them a nursery rhyme, they'll know it inside out, just verbatim, without even understanding meaning. So Quran and Hifad, you see, it's like Abu Isa said, when you uh, judge children and whatever you teach them at an early age, it's like engraving in stone. And when you try and learn as an adult or memorize later, it's like painting in water. It's very, very hard to learn much later. And, you know, the, it's just not as, uh, as easy as we've all seen as an adult life trying to memorize. It's much harder. And the children, for them, it's just so much easier. So whatever you can do now in terms of Hifad and Ilm generally for them, Especially hips of Quran, because the thing is, um, you know, they may not understand the meanings, but the barakah from that is just immense. Uh, if your child becomes a hafiz of Quran, you know, inshallah, that you on uh, in, in Akhara have a crown to wear, and obviously they raise their level of uh, jannah. Sorry, their level of jannah is up to the level that they've memorized Quran. So if you've memorized all of Quran, then you really should expect nothing less than for those. And the other thing is that the, um, you know, the Qur'an is a nur for us and it really is something that, you know, it kind of basically spiritually just really um, helps us to flourish. And if it's there in the background, even if whatever they do later in life and they err or they have, you know, that Qur'an is there as a base, inshallah. Great. Jazakallah khair for, um, for sharing this with us. Um, can I also ask, um, so when, you're, uh, when your children are doing hifz, mashallah, so do you have to get involved in that as well? Um, so some parents do. Personally, I don't because they don't like me to uh, pick their dream. So uh, they'd rather go to their father <laughs> because Just uh, I suppose, uh, how, I suppose I'm a little like bit more picky with their recitation. So they'll say, no, uh, I'll be like. so, but Alhamdulillah, the two of them help each other anyway. So uh, right, Alhamdulillah, they, they do a lot of self-learning, so that they're getting on with it quite well, mashallah. Great. Um, just remind us, how old are your children? Uh, my daughter's 12 and my son is 10. And um, 
how can you share a bit about um, your relationship with your children and uh, um, do you think when you come back from work will you are you able to give quality time to your children and what does quality time really means to you mm. so that's the hard thing it's very very hard to balance and you know you, you learn to accept that there's no such thing as a hundred percent you know perfect parenting it's always about a learning curve so for example when they were younger I spent a lot more time with them did bedtime stories with them every night till they were about six or seven and um, when they you know got a bit older gave them a bit more space also I became more involved in studies um, even if I would say you know it's very hard to have that work-life balance and even with your own interests and it is just a case of give and take keep asking them you know is there anything I can change about myself what were you happy with you know have this kind of period of introspection mm. regularly with your children uh, and also just you know open communication quality time is better than quantity obviously because you know you can be spending lots of quantity time but not be really be present with them so for example one might be on the laptop you might be on your phone and you know you might have spent the weekend together but you haven't actually spent that weekend talking to them and um, you know naturally you know we can take for granted what's immediately around us and so you know it's a constant learning process I would say Great, um, and I could see that um, you, you've been uh, involved with MEND and um, other youth organizations. Um, how do your children um, um, adjust to, to your very busy routine? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so they, they do, um, so they do th sort of uh, frown a little bit, oh, why are you involved in this and that. The thing with the youth organizations, my daughter actually attends that, so you know, it's for the yeah. benefit of the children and she enjoys that. With men, you know, I sometimes I take them along to certain events and sometimes obviously meetings I don't. Um, it's all about balance and explaining to them along the way why we're doing what we're doing because, you know, civic engagement is very important as well. And, you know, with respect to what's happening around the country and increasing Islamophobia, uh, it's something I feel strongly about. Um, I just explain to them that basically, you know, this is important for our future and your future in this country, but we try and, you know, nip things in the bud and we have um, the ability to kind of stand up and say we're not quite happy with the situation as it is at the moment. Yes, I think it's very useful when we involve kids in our own projects and it makes things a lot easier as well. Jazakum yeah. um, for your uh, for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, no I'll, um, inshallah, we'll take more questions uh, from the attendees in the end if they want to ask you something. Um, no problem. We'll, just, we'll just move on um, to our next um, guest um, on our panel today. Um, I can't see Dr. Janjua. Oh, yeah, she's here now. Uh, Dr. Junja, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum uh, Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're very uh, pleased to have you with us. Um, you have been involved with um, BIMA. Um, and um, let me just um, let the attendees know a bit more about you, and inshallah, you can tell us a bit um, about you yourself. So, Dr. Aisha Janjua, she's a year six specialty trainee at Birmingham Heartlands Hospital. Uh, she has done a lot of work towards medical education, clinical research within uh, obstetrics and gynecology. Um, she's an educational board member at Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, uh, and she's also a curriculum advisory group trainee associate in GMC. Uh, apart from these roles, she has also been involved um, in creating a number of online revision modules in obs and gynae. Um, and mashallah, she's leading Beamer um, in West Midlands, um, and she has been um, working you know, with various organizations. And I think um, uh, during her undergraduate years as well, she has been a part of um, fifth year undergrad committee as well. So, Dr. Jandu, um you wear so many hats, and um, how do you manage your time um, while being a mother as well? Assalamualaikum, uh, sister. Jazakallah for having me on board. I think, you know, mashallah, the sister before really, really hit the nail on the head when she said that you've got to make a list of priorities and you've got to think about what's important to you. Um, like I mentioned to Sister Mutul Khair, who set up the webinar, my children are five years of age and my son is um, 11 months old. So I have a very young family in comparison to maybe some of the other speakers. I'm still on my maternity leave for my 11 month old and uh, subhanAllah I'll be going back to work uh, at the end of January, early February. So you know my kind of list of priorities is probably a bit different and it involves a lot more nappies and um, you know feeding schedules and you know play groups as opposed to homework and um, A level exams. So you know I, I've had to I think wrap my head around what's important for me and I think one thing that that's really helped me prioritize everything is um, 
putting it down on paper I'm you know just thinking okay what do I have on my plate literally and how am I going to manage this to the best of my ability because time is precious and you know your body has a right on you so you need to rest your family has a right on you and you need to give that to them um, your husband your mother your father your sisters brothers etc and then your work has a right on you because it's an amana from Allah that you're able to do the job that you're actually able to do and I think mashallah we're very very blessed to be in this amazing amazing career because you know every time we visit a sick person if you make the niya even on your way to work every time you visit a sick person 70,000 angels are making dua for you and every time you save a human life you like you've saved the whole of humanity so we're just if we've got the right meal we're just accumulating rewards within our work and I think that's just you know it's unparalleled alhamdulillah and we're very very blessed by Allah to be where we are great mashallah um, Dr. Jinjua um, I think um, obviously you say your children are very young at the moment um, and you're a trainer yourself um, especially with this with these grueling training years um, what advice you would like to give um, junior doctors and other healthcare professionals about pregnancies um, during training years? I mean, there's a general trend that we see these days about delaying pregnancies and um, starting a family unless you're more established in your career. What are your thoughts on this issue? I think, subhanAllah, there's never a right answer. Um, everyone's different. Everyone's family circumstances, family support system, or the lack of, is, is very different. And I think you've just got to be realistic about what you have and what you don't have. So, for example, say there's a sister who's got really, really excellent family support in terms of parents or parents-in-law, sisters, and, you know, she'd like to have children early. And that's actually feasible because she's got the family support around her. So she might not need to wait until her postgraduate exams are over or you know she's finished off a few main kind of components of her training whereas someone else who doesn't have any family support but actually think right I need to be really realistic about it and think about what I can take on board so there's no formula as such although alhamdulillah we'd love to have a very straight answer uh, from my perspective it's just um, I it didn't I didn't kind of work I didn't plan it that way subhanallah Allah's the best of planners but um, I managed I was pregnant at the time I was doing my part two MRCOG which just happened to be the case so my daughter sat my um, part two with me as such and uh, you know I was pregnant at my graduation from the as a member of the Royal College so it just happened, happened and I think you know subhanallah just being pregnant the product of being pregnant Helped yeah. me to uh, to pass my exams because I was, I was in a way telling Allah that Subhanallah, I, I don't think I can do this again with a, with a baby. I don't know how people do this um, because you obviously need you know you need an immense amount of concentration and time to be able to revise. Definitely. And I do know sister who've actually studied with um, children and it and it, that actually broke my heart because they were saying things like they'd try and revise and the baby would be knocking on the door going, "Mommy, when are you coming out to play?" So um, Subhanallah, I think you know I. I, I think if you can get through some major portions in your life, um, you know, in terms of at least the first first exam, at least, you know, do because you're making life easier for yourself because it, it only gets more difficult. You're, you're kind of managing more and more things as you get older, your children's extracurricular activities, their Quran lessons, you know, um, you know, stuff that they have to do, whether it's tennis or um, swimming or sports or anything like that. So you'll always have more things to do um, so inshallah I just I think you know see what works for you is my is my kind of honest advice yeah I think everybody's got their own circumstances and we have to find our own ways but it's def definitely very encouraging to hear that more and more people are finding um, their ways when it comes to families and um, managing their careers um, I think um, a question that keeps um, uh, popping on in our head, especially as young mothers, we're, we're really scared of losing the family side of our lives if we are busy with our very demanding careers. Um, I mean, sometimes our to-do list just gets out of control. So, um, I mean, um, sometimes we hear from mothers about that mommy guilt. Did you have your share of uh, mommy guilt and how did you cope with that? And, <laughs> I am currently still having my share of mommy guilt. I don't think it ever stops. Um, I don't think it ever stops, subhanAllah. So, you know, it's um, it's not something that ever goes away. I think you always have that guilt. And um, inshallah, it's about coping with that guilt. Um, because, you know, you know, obviously you're trying to multitask and you are stretched in a hundred different directions. So yeah. I think you'll always feel guilty that you're not there at 7 p.m. doing a laparoscopic ectopic pregnancy, which, you know, you would do if you didn't have 
husband and children, you yes, feel okay. guilty because you're not there for your children, you know, to pick them up from school. So you're feeling guilty that way. And then I think the thing is, don't expect perfection. You know, don't expect that you can do everything and learn to say no. The most important thing is if you can't do something, learn to say no. And um, recently, one of the things I have done is I've actually, recently one of the things I have done is I've actually said that no, I can't, I'm, I was one of the treasurers for the Midlands Research Obs and Gynae Society. I was on the committee since the conception and unfortunately I can't continue because I've got too much on my plate. I've actually had to say after three years with the Midlands Research Obs and Gynae Society, I can't be a treasurer right now because I'm going back to work in January. I've got my advanced training special modules, I've got my children, I've got a few other research projects to do. So, you know, I'm going to take a break. And there's no shame, there's no harm in doing that because you know your own limitations. I think um, um, your voice is breaking down a bit, uh, Dr. Chandra, but we managed to get the gist of what you said. I'm just trying to see if um, I'll just uh, unmute an attendee to make sure that um, they're able to hear us. Uh, Sister Zainab Ghafoor, you are here with us in the attendee list. Are you able to hear us properly? Uh, you need to unmute yourself before you speak. I just want to make sure that our attendees can hear us. We're having some problems uh, seeing the question box. Um, let me just take another attendee. Uh, Zenith Rajabali, are you here with us, sister? And we've got Zenith Omerji here as well. Sisters, are you able to hear me properly? Um, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, Jazakallah. Thank you for letting us know. Um, I think I asked um, Mrs. Vasti as well about uh, her concept of quality time with her children. Um, I think I would like to ask the Dr. Janju as well, um, especially when we, we, we get, get back home, we've got so much on our mind, we've got our own um, careers to think about, we've got these CPD modules to do, um, and we've got these audits to think about, but then obviously we need to tend to our children as well, uh, and the evening time is the only time that we can give to our children. So what strategies can you share with us about um, how do you manage your evening time really and uh, how do you make sure that you give uh, good time to your family as well? Hi, sister, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Dr. Zendra, we can, yes, ah, okay. please go on. And was that question directed to me? Yes, did you manage to hear what no. I just said? Um, no, it was very broken, that's why I was checking if you could still hear me. Sorry, I'll just, I'll just repeat my question. Um, we were just trying to have your thoughts on uh, what really quality time means to you when it comes to family. Um, when we come back um, uh, later in the evening uh, from work, obviously we've got so much to do, we've got our own uh, um, career related stuff, uh, we've got our e-portfolios to fill out, we've got some CPD modules to do and then uh, we, we need to make sure that we give enough time to our families as well. So can you share a bit of, uh, of your evening schedule with us? How do you manage to, um, how do you make sure that you give quality time to your family when you come back from work? I think what I usually do is if I'm, I mean I can only speak from my experience of working with one child because I was pregnant with the other when I was working and what I used to do is speak to, you know, and if I had any friends to speak to, catch up with any work phone calls, I'd do that on the way to work and the way back from work um, but the minute I'd reach home I'd turn my phone on silent so it would not be interrupting any time with my family and essentially just, um, you know, talk to my daughter about her day, play around, have some fun, if she had some work, so finish off her work. Um, do the usual house stuff and then essentially once she's asleep um, and she's kind of you know had that time with her to put her to bed 
I'd stop my work after that. So usually I'd end up working between 8 and 10, sometimes even even 12, depending on kind of the workload for the evening. And that's the way I'd actually manage it. I think it's important to give them those few hours because those are the only few hours. And they've probably got a lot of things that they want to say to you, including you know, what's happened in their day, has something significant happened, is there something troubling them? And they want that time to be able to say that to you. So it's very important to, to have that time. Yes, definitely. And I think we all um, struggle, um, especially when we come back from work. There's so much uh, housework to do as well. And uh, we've got our own to-do lists. So uh, everything sometimes just get out of control. But I think, um, um, as you mentioned, we need to adopt a few strategies to make sure um, that we... we I think one of the things that I find really, really important with my family is at least a few times in the week, it's important for us all to sit down and have a family meal. So a family dinner on the weekend, a family meal where we're sitting down just probably the way we grew up, you know, with everyone on the table, having a nice meal, talking about everyone's day, um, asking how they're feeling, did something funny happen? And I think that really brings the family unit together because it, it emphasizes that this is the priority time for all, well, for us at the moment, all four of us. So even when it's my husband who's come, you know, who's, who's at home. So uh, we've got the four of us who sit down for a nice meal and we just talk. And uh, my daughter, Sophie, actually says, oh, no one's asked me about my day today. And, you know, it's, it's quite funny because she understands that, you know, we, we all should ask about each other's day and what happened and, um, and it's, it's just the time to bond with each other and that's very important and the one thing I would say is turn phones off, turn tablets and uh, boxes and Wi-Fi's and all that, you know, well, your know, Wii's and all sorts of things off because that is a quality time which you'll never get back. Yes, definitely. Um, I think um, um, I'm conscious that you need to leave earlier, Dr. Sanjua, but just a last question. Um, Mashallah, you've also been involved with a lot of voluntary work um, and you've been working in various organizations. Uh, you had been a local rep for BMA um, and now, Mashallah, you're leading BMA in West Midlands. Um, what would you like to say uh, to mothers about volunteer work? Does it enrich your life in any way? I think it does because the same thing with your career. I think if, you, if you're good at what you can potentially provide to your career or to the community, you come back very refreshed to your children and you, you provide a fantastic role model, hopefully, inshallah, inshallah, hopefully you provide a good role model for your children to see that, you know, we should be involved um, in our communities from the very start. We, we should be giving, we should be considerate to our neighbors and, uh, you, know, the, you know, that whole side of things. And I think that's definitely very, very important for them to see. I don't think you can take on too much. So, alhamdulillah, I've got a team of people in the West Midlands within Bima, so I don't obviously do things by myself. And I am very kind of straightforward about not being able to do meetings early on and only after 8 p.m. because my children are asleep by 8, inshallah. So I can do meetings online or over the phone after 8. So I think it's about accommodating um, your commitments with your life. But if you, if you find that things are getting too much, um, don't feel that you have to say yes to everything. Um, the power of no. I remember someone saying this to me in my late teens and early 20s and I th kept thinking okay you know this is probably just some old person talk but the power of no um, is just amazing because if you can't do something this just say that you can't do it because you've got your list of priorities somewhere else and you know whether it's you, you can't actually socialize every night of the week or you can't be at every single gala or fair or PTA meeting that's that's absolutely fine you know just be sensible in the amount of stuff you can take on. Hello, Hello Asalaamu Alaikum. Can you hear me now? Dr. Chanjua, can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you now. Um, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, and I think um, a thought that keeps coming up um, during this discussion is that we are our children's first role models. And obviously, we, as, as parents of young children, we need to realize that what we are sowing today, we shall reap tomorrow. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and um, thank you for uh, taking some time out in your very busy schedule. Um, and I think you have to leave as well. But, uh, uh, if you've got any questions, inshallah, we, we can take it from the attendees later on and we can pass them to you later on, inshallah. 
That's perfect. Just not hard. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Chanjua. Um, and I think as we talk about the philosophy of uh, reap what you sow, um, we will we will talk um, more about this uh, to our next um, guest on our panel today. Um, we are very privileged to have uh, Dr. Sabina Jamil on um, as a guest with us um, on this discussion. Um, let me just tell you a bit about her, and I'm sure she will um, tell us more about herself and um, what kind of projects she's involved in. Dr. Sabina Jamil is an uh, Associate Dean for GP Education um, and she educationally managed about 250 GP trainers um, and uh, about 250 GP trainees in Birmingham. Um, she also looks after about 800 foundation trainees in GP posts, um, so that is across the West Midlands. Um, and she's also a GP with special interest in sexual health and family planning um, and I think she's, she does about four sessions per week. She was um, awarded RCGP Quality Awards for Education and Training in 2011, and she's very, uh, very much involved with medical education. Um, and I think she's uh, she's considered as an expert um, by um, um, within um, uh, the West Midlands Deanery. Um, and with with all these qualifications, she's also doing her PhD in medical wisdom, uh, which I think she will tell more about herself. Assalamu alaikum, um, Dr. Jamil. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, Salam. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, we would definitely like to, to know about the um, superhuman number of things that you're doing. And um, uh, especially with regards to mothers, how do you manage to do so much while being a mother of three kids? Just remind us your, the ages of your kids as well, please. Okay. Um, well. First of all, alhamdulillah, I'm honoured you've asked me to be um, on this panel. I'm by no means an expert when it comes to motherhood. Um, anything that I achieve is obviously from, all from Allah. Um, my children's ages, my eldest is going to be 17 in February, that's Hayyan. My daughter is going, she's 14. And then I have a little one who is six. Um, I may also add at this point that having a 10 year age difference has really helped with some babysitting issues. <laughs> so, Dr. Jamil, tell us a bit about your journey in medicine as a mother. Okay, and, um, so I, I got married when I was a GP trainee, um, and then when I was a GP ST3, I had my first child. Um, I was full time up until that point, and after having my son, I then went um, part time to six sessions a week. I have to admit, I've never actually been full time from that point, but I'm now doing three part-time roles which equates to being full-time, but alhamdulillah I feel they're all very aligned um, and I don't do things that don't align with my values and I don't do it for titles, I actually feel that there's a purpose in what I'm doing and that purpose aligns with my dean. Great, mashallah. Um, how is, um, I think we would like to know about your relationship with your children and um, how do you manage uh, so far, especially you've got a, a teenage um, uh, children as well. Uh, we would like to hear some parenting tips from you as well, really, um, especially when you're working um, with um, so many part-time jobs. How do you manage to give um, good, time, good quality time to your children? And I'm sure uh, as children grow up, they, they require more, more attention from us. Um, so how do you manage um, to make sure that you, you develop a strong relationship with them? I think the first thing again reiterates what um, the other sisters have said um, and that's about role modeling and being well and feeling fulfilled yourself and inshallah if you if you manage that or you're working towards that your children will see how much um, they can get from you because you're well, you're healthy um, you're practicing your faith, doing your salah, attending to your deen, um, and that in itself is is good for the children and raising the children. Just some really practical tips when it comes to what's helped me, and again, um, reiterating what I think Sister Aisha said, um, everybody's circumstances are different, and they different levels of support from family members, etc. Um, but you have to work with what you've got 
I think I do have to mention at this time, I am fully aware that I think it's about one in three hours is older. Therefore, it's really difficult to sort of self-actualize um, and accomplish things if they're in a difficult situation. So do I go out to all those systems and please seek some help? But again, going back to some really practical tips, um, you have probably heard health visitors and people say things like, oh, don't sleep with your children, put them in the cot. Well, I ignored all that. I breastfed my kids until they were two and co-slept with them until they were two. That meant we had a really close bond, um, generally at night time because I was working in the day. Um, and thankfully, uh, um, a positive thing to do, and some of the we should raise children is, is not aimed at actually nurturing them and engendering that bond. Um, other things, I'm not ashamed of my kids now that they're getting older. They do a lot of chores. My 14-year-old daughter can sometimes cook us dinner. Um, my son has irons his clothes. My, my hubby also irons. Um, you and Sorry, Sabina, Sabina, you're breaking. You know Please, can you repeat yourself? Your, your voice is breaking. I get a lot out of little things like this, the school run. I sit and talk to my kids. Um, we eat together. This is how our parents treated us. My mum was a dietitian that trained in India, but she never worked here. Um, and I could always see that was a source of frustration for her. But mashallah bless her, she did her um, GCSEs at the same time as me when I was 16. So that shows some determination in professional development. Um, and again, I think if we show our kids that we are committed to our own development, then they get motivated too. Yes, indeed. I think um, with the, when we are learning ourselves, we develop the interest in, in our children as well about learning. Hello? And can you hear us, Dr. Jamil? I think your voice was breaking down a bit. We managed to get, get the last bit of your um, of your conversation, but we we missed a bit um, in the beginning. Can you hear us, Dr. Jamil? We can hear you now. We can still hear you, Dr. Meal. Can you hear us? I'm really sorry, I can't hear the questions. Because the sound is breaking up. We managed to get uh, what you said in the end, uh, but your voice was breaking a lot. Can you hear me talking now? Dr. Jamil, can you hear me? I can hear you. We we got the um, we got what you said in the end about um, your own learning and the need to develop this in your children, the the, the desire to learn yourself, and and when our kids see us doing something, and um, inshallah, that, that's a good role model for them too. Um, we would like to uh, hear your tips about how you keep up with your own professional studies um, while taking care of three children. I mean, you've been involved extensively with um, medical education, and uh, uh, now you're doing your PhD, which we would like to hear more about. Did you get my question, Dr. Jamil? Uh, please bear with us. Um, we're just having some technical issues. Uh, we're just going to sort it out and inshallah uh, Dr. Meal is going to be back with us.
Dr. Jameen, are you back with us? Can you hear me, Dr. Jameen? Right, while we um, will try to take Dr. Jameel again um, on the line. Uh, meanwhile, um, let me just introduce uh, one of our BIMA members to you, who's mashallah, uh, uh, she's, she, she has been the key person arranging uh, this webinar. Savita, you can take questions from audience while she's logging in again, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Um, We've got a question box um, if uh, people would like to uh, write their questions or there's an op option to raise your hands if somebody has a question. And then I can unmute you and then you can ask um, a question directly. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum This is Dr. Jamil. Yes. Welcome. Sorry about that. That's okay. We can hear you now. I think you were trying to tell us um, a bit about your own profession studies, um, and um, we, I think we would like to hear more about the PhD that you're doing and um, how do you manage to keep on top of things with your kids and family. Okay, well, if I reversed a little bit. I did um, a master's in medical education, and I did this while having um, two young children, but I didn't rush to do it. I did it because I enjoyed it. So I would study um, a week of lectures, and then I'd have three months to do an assignment. I, it actually took me six years to do it, but I'm I really enjoyed it. Mashallah. And then um, at the end of that, I did a dissertation on knowledge management. And that was actually about how important tacit knowledge is. So that's conversations with other people. It's not the stuff that's written in guidelines. It's the, the wisdoms that come across in narratives. So from that point onwards, I, I had this sort of need to learn more about the metacognitive aspects of learning. So that's not the things that you're taught. It's the other stuff, like the role modeling, like the reflective practice that we're often not taught about. So. Um, a few years ago, three years, four years ago, I was just surfing the net and I w became aware of a new center at Birmingham University called the Ju Jubilee Center for Character and Virtues. So I thought, wow, mashallah, that sounds like um, it does align with what I'm really interested in. And I've always been interested in the sort of character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Islamic um, adab and things like that. So I thought, I'm really interested to see and what I could do there. So I spoke to them and I told them about my master's degree and um, there's a professor there who's from Iceland and he said you need to look at wisdom, medical wisdom. And what I'm actually looking at is something called phronesis, spelled P-H-R-O-N-E-S-I-S. Phronesis is practical wisdom. And um, I started reading up on this and uh, mashallah I found out that it, in the golden age of Islam there were scholars, Muslim scholars, who were also looking at this because phronesis is essentially a concept described by the Greeks, so by Aristotle. And we had these amazing scholars in the golden age of Islam that were studying these things and yet now we become close-minded almost to, to learning from um, other cultures, other professions. So I became fascinated with this and I really have motivation to continue. And what's beautiful about the kind of study that I'm doing is actually what we're talking about is character, virtue, compassion, integrity, kindness, all the things that the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated. And, and actually, a lot of my work is driven by a, a love for all of humanity um, and understanding what virtue really means. Um, I remember when I was a teenager, if you read some of the 
more sort of Indian Pakistani texts. Virtue was only really used in context with chastity. Um, and I thought it's so much more than that. And I have to admit, in doing my studying, I've really learnt what virtue means. Um, and I wonder that I think it's helped my dean, it's helped my kids understand. And, and looking at things from an academic perspective um, has given a lot of clarity, more generally. Uh, it's really great to hear uh, Dr. Jamil about um, uh, how Quran and Hadith uh, are actually inspiring you in your in your studies in, in medical wisdom. Um, and I think with um, you've got uh, kids uh, who are mashallah teenagers now, um, and we've got a few um, uh, questions from doctors who've got grown-up kids, uh, and they're really struggling um, with regards to developing relationships with them. Uh, especially because um, because of the lack of time um, as working parents, would you like to give some advice um, to to parents uh, with teenagers about um, some time management tips or some strategies to develop good relationships with your children, especially with teenagers? Okay, but obviously I'm I'm by no means an expert, so I'm only telling you what I think might work and what I aspire and try to do. The first and foremost, your teenagers, no matter how moody they are, they need to know that you love them. And they might, you might think, oh, they don't want hugs and they don't want kisses. That may be the case, but reiterate to them that you love them and say it. Um, they may seem a bit macho or whatever to accept it, but deep down they will accept it. And I think that is the most important thing. The other thing is sometimes I think teenagers need us maybe more um, than younger kids um, and it is an art to tap into how to help them the most. I think the greatest thing is just being available and open to what they want to talk about. They will probably hope that you're not be judgmental and shout at them straight away because they're, they're learning about their own boundaries and in doing so they might want to discuss things with you. So there's no point um, blazing into flames out of anger if they've just mentioned a word that, I don't know, um, a party or whatever. Sit down and talk with them like they're rational adults. Um, for example, yesterday with my 17-year-old son, I, f I actually felt I hadn't spent a lot of time with him this, this week, so I took him out for lunch. Um, we had a nice lunch. Um, needless to say, he ate quite a lot, which is what teenage boys do. Um, and then with my daughter, we went out for a girls' night out last night. I think my sister-in-law is listening. Mashallah, thank you for sorting that out for us. It was um, a Muslim women's event. We also do physical activities together. So with my um, daughter, we did uh, a 5K run together, raising money for a hospice. I do sports with my other kids. I do taekwondo with my little son. And these are opportunities to, to have informal chats, ask them who their friends are. We played this really funny game once at dinner, and we all had to name um, 10 friends of the other person. So I had to name 10 of Safi's friends, 10 of Khalil's friends, 10 of Hayan's friends, and they had to name 10 of my friends. And it was a really interesting game, because actually, do we really know who our kids' friends are? Um, because again, I think um, their friendship group is extremely important in shaping who they're going to become. Great, mashallah. I think um, you're very much right, Dr. Jamil, that um, we really need to involve kids um, in our own activities to make sure um, that they learn what we want them to learn. Um, and it's important for us to, to, to act ourselves uh, before we can ask our children um, to adopt uh, certain ways. Um, I think um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, um, and we've got um, uh, to take a few questions from the our attendees as well. Um, so, inshallah, um, let's open the floor to, to the audience. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jamil, uh, Mrs. Wasti, and uh, Dr. Janjua for, um, for sharing your valuable insights and uh, your thoughts with us today on this topic. Um, and inshallah, um, um, from the platform of Beamer, we're hoping to, um, to start a blog um, with regards to mothers, motherhood and medicine. Um, there's a blog called Mothers in Medicine, which is run by American doctors, um, and I always found it very useful 
um, to, to see what people are going through uh, with regards to their families when they are in training years. Um, and it was really a source of encouragement for me. Um, well, I thought we should um, have our own platform as, as uh, Muslim healthcare professionals where we can relate more um, and uh, do things according to our own values. So inshallah, uh, stay tuned. Um, we, we will be inshallah working on this project and uh, if anyone wants to join us um, for this project, please let us know and inshallah um, we will work together. Uh, so um, let's take some questions uh, from the attendees. Um, is there anyone who would like to ask a question? There's an option to raise your hand. Uh, if you can I think see. ask a question from Fatima. She has put a long question. It will be better in her own rating. Sorry, I didn't get you, Dr. Amtre. Fatima? Uh, I can't see her on, on... Oh, yes, I can see it. I have unmuted her. Fatima, please right. unmute yourself. Somebody can. Yeah. Um, can I just read out the question? I think Fatima has already posted it on the question box. Uh, so this question is uh, directed towards Dr. Jameel. So Aisha says, Salam Dr. Aisha touched on briefly. Um, so Dr. I think um, she asking Dr. Janju, I'm not sure. Um, well the question is that um, she's starting ophthalmology training next year when my son will be just over one and need to sit everything as a mother. Are there any tips on how to revise with babies, kids? Anything I should mentally prepare myself for? Um, and she's asking, I was considering start, uh, starting to revise now on maternity leave in time to sit uh, her part one in spring, but then feels like it will take away from the special time that I have with my son at the moment. Um, so she, she's asking for some advice, um, pointers or tips, inshallah. Is that question to me? I'm Sabina, Jamila. Uh, yes, Dr. Jamila, I think Dr. Janju is not with us, so if, if you mind just um, please answering this question. Okay, so, come. so um, one of the things that I found when I had really little children and I had exams to study for is that most people without children might allocate whatever, two, three months to prepare for the exam. If you have a child, make that four or five months because you can't anticipate things like when the child gets ill, gets a cough, and cold, and you know sometimes, especially with little children around the age of one, when they're sick, they're literally on your lap 24 hours um, for two or three days, and you can't do anything, no housework, no nothing. So if you have exams to prepare for, I would say be organized, do a little bit regularly, but start well in advance so that if the day before the exam your child falls ill, you've actually covered um, most of the ground that you need to cover with regard to content for that exam. Zakala. Um, there's another question um, that is raised by uh, Sister Firdosi Khan um, and she says that I'm currently doing an undergraduate degree after which I hope to study medicine inshallah but I'm worried that I won't be able to fulfill my own personal life events um, example, I want to marry quite young and how do you balance your medical studies and still fulfill these, especially if you have pressure from cultural expectations of family? Um, we've got Dr. Jamila and uh, Mrs. Vasti here, whoever wants to answer this question. I'm, I'm happy to ask it, answer it from my perspective. I think obviously make lots and lots of dua to, to, for Allah to guide you. Um, I was quite blessed in the fact that my husband's mother was a working woman as well. This gave him a sort of good insight into the challenges that um, a working mother has with regard to looking after her family and working. I think it also gave him an extra dimension of patience and tolerance. Um, so, inshallah, may Allah bless you with a good husband, make lots of dua, and most importantly, do an istikhara um, for all these difficult life decisions. 
Mm -hmm. Mrs. Wasi, would you, would you like to add something? Uh, alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, first of all, I was going to suggest Sathal Istikhara uh, regarding your decision because, you know, medicine isn't just five years, it is more than that, um, a lot more depending on where you want to go. And um, if you want to kind of achieve everything within a reasonable frame of time of your uh, age, uh, you, you will be kind of overloading yourself a little bit and it is very much dependent upon who you marry as well as um, Dr. Jamil mentioned. So um, obviously do your undergraduate degree and then do a Sahara as to whether medicine is for you or not. Um, with regards to marriage as well, I'm not quite sure if that means that you've already, you know who you're going to marry or you know you're hoping to but you've no idea who. So what I would always do is start off with what's in front of you. Marriage may or may not happen. It may or may not happen easily or while you're whilst you're young. So work with what you have, um, you know, the eggs in the basket, rather than thinking, well, I want this, 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 and that, and then uh, focus on what you do have and focus on continuing with that. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, you know, again, lots of du'a and uh, just lots of kind of reality checks and prioritization again, um, and that's it really. Jazakallah. Um, before I move on to the ne next question, I would just like to introduce Dr. Abdul Khair here because she's uh, one of our very senior members um, and mashallah she's got a lot of insight into um, the topic motherhood and medicine. Um, Dr. Abdul Khair, she's um, currently a general practitioner with special interest in women's health. Um, she's um, uh, She passed a MRCGP, um, I think. Uh, what year was that? Just remind us, Dr. Abdul Khair. Yep, um, 2013. 2013, right. Um, Why? She's, <laughs> Sorry. She, she uh, holds a postgraduate diploma in uh, sexual health and reproduction and she's work, currently working towards um, her diploma in gynecology and uh, specialist in women's health and medical education. Um, she's also in the process of uh, pursuing a career as a GP trainer, appraiser. Um, she's, um, Mashallah, she's been um, involved with BIMA as a founding member and um, she's been involved in organizing different uh, national and local events. Um, she's, um, uh, she has been, uh, she's organized a lot of webinars uh, um, in BIMA for, on various topics including um, uh, Ramadan and healthcare professionals um, and some um, topics uh, related specifically to uh, women in medicine. Uh, she's um, an author of a new book called Five a Day for Learning Basic Arabic and Quran Words, a Quranic Word Handbook for Students of Knowledge. And uh, she's currently in the process of completing her diploma in Arabic and Islamic studies from uh, uh, Sheikh Dr. Akram Nadvi from Oxford. Um, so um, she has been involved with other uh, organizations where, where she was um, teaching Quran and Tadweed. And mashallah, she's got three young children. Um, and um, so I think um, if you want to um, answer some of the questions as well, Dr. Mdukhe, that will be really nice because um, you've got, with your experience, I'm sure you will be able to, to guide um, the, the young lot here. Uh, there's another question um, by a sister called Rosina Noor, and she said, and she's asked, how much. Uh, so if there's any, what, um, she's asked how much did wanting somebody start a family play a role in choosing your speciality and were there any specialities that you excluded earlier on in your medical career? So somebody who wants to start a family and um, trying to decide between a speciality. Uh, I think you asked me, you asked the right person to be on Savita uh, Salaamu Alaikum wa to everyone. Uh, because it did affect me uh, when I got married. Actually, I just graduated and got married, and Alhamdulillah, uh, within about like a year, I had my first daughter, and I kind of have grown up with my children. Um, and um, and I did, it did affect me. I love pediatrics to the bit, and I still love it. <laughs> I still I might do it at some point. My uh, pediatrics postgraduate or something related to that. Uh, in my uh, career, once my children and my family is more stable, but it did. I changed my route, and I went to um, a GP which Yes, I like just after my foundation. Yes, because I already had my daughter, and the foundation year one, I had my son, and I was like heavily pregnant with him. And when I was finishing my foundation year, so Alhamdulillah, I, I did change my mind uh, and for the VTS exam, GP VTS, and did all my. Uh, you know, the uh, hospital years after maternity leave of 18 months after my son. So, Alhamdulillah, yeah, it does, it does actually help you what you choose, what type of speciality 
uh, what specialty you're in, because hospital on call, as uh, Aisha was saying, uh, standing in the theater up till 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, it just affects your family, and you do have that guilt feeling always. And I still remember in coming back home, um, praying for my children and for myself, and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, don't put me in any kind of test from my children's side or anything that where I have, like, they have been affected, neglect from my side. So, yeah. Um, I, I, I think it, you have to be very practical how much help you have got at home and uh, if you I didn't have any family at all around me M my mom and my parents they are away in uh, back home and whereas my husband's family is not here so it's, my husband was in the full-time training as well so alhamdulillah we both finished kind of together he's a consultant now and I'm a GP so I'm very happy what I did what I chose and it has helped me to um, to choose um, you know in my ways and to set my priorities. So along with part time work and looking after my children and giving them uh, like full time what I could do, which I think it was right for them. And like Alhamdulillah. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. Uh, Sorry, may I? Yeah, please. Uh, so, so I'm Sabina. Um, when I was a junior house officer, because that was pre-foundation training, um, I did dabble with the thought of being a surgeon, a general surgeon. I really enjoyed my surgical posts. Um, but yes, then that thought came to me about, actually, I really want to get married and, and have children. Um, so then I went down the route of GP training. And I have no regrets, much on that. My father was, in fact, a GP in Manchester. Um, and general practice is diverse enough to help you with whatever um, sort of interests you have. Um, it was actually after um, I did my GP training that I did my medical education qualifications and realized that it was so intuitive and that I enjoyed it so much. Um, so Alhamdulillah, this path that, that's happened with the blessing of Allah um, wasn't necessarily what I was thinking when I was a junior doctor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jamil, um, for, for your insight. Um, there's a question from a sister called uh, Sadia Zaman, and she's asked that would it be wise to apply for the academic foundation program if you plan on volunteering time for the medical uh, Muslim community, um, having a family and socializing with friends still? Um, I, I, I have you, a little... I, I, yes, go on, please. The top tip is actually, if you get involved in medical education, generally, it's more um, family-friendly hours. Um, so generally, my working hours when I'm doing my deanery work is 9 to 5. So, so I think that might help the sister with her decision, but I think it might help her um, do her community work. Because if you do your standard general practice surgeries, you might end up finishing at 7, half past 7, 8 o'clock even. Right, great. Um, anybody want to talk to the panelists themselves? Um, I can unmute them if you raise your hands. Anybody can ask a question, um, and there's a, an icon that uh, shows a raised hand, so you can just click on that and we will know that you want to ask a question and then we can unmute you. There's also a chat box, um, if you can see at the, um, um, on your screens. Can I ask a question to Sabina? <laughs> yes, sure, Dr. Amdakhaya, please go ahead. Are you there, Sabina? Assalamualaikum. Sabina, uh, when, you know, your topic of your PhD, you were talking about virtue. Can you de define it a little bit more and what exactly you mean by that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll go back to exactly what I mean by phrenesis. We tend to find that in medicine, um, we're very driven by guidelines. 
um, and very driven by rules and regulations. So the GMC duties of a doctor will say, you must do this, you should do this, you must do this. Um, so not to get too technical with my PhD, but um, medicine is based by um, moral frameworks which are rules-based. Um, the thing is, I don't actually believe you can achieve excellence with the rules. And you may find in society people will do something and say, well, there's no rule to say I can't do that. Um, yet it's the not, not the most virtuous thing that they did. It's just that they're, they're living their life based on rules. Um, whereby I think that if we develop virtues in, in the medical profession, um, and that might be things like compassion and knowing the boundaries of compassion in practice, that actually then we, we aspire more towards excellence than just following the rules and the regulations. And this is more applicable um, in, in, the, in specialities like general practice, where we deal with uncertainty. So um, practical wisdom is actually more to do with doing the right thing at the right time for the right person for the right reason. And the right reason is actually for communities to flourish, um, which is more, it's, it's got a technical term, which is eudaimonia. Um, whereas these days, we find a lot of our society is driven by hedonia, which is doing things for personal gain, rather than the more altruistic way to look at things. So in that respect, I really do feel it aligns with Islam. So those particular virtues and how to nurture those virtues do very much align with stuff that we see in the Quran. So, for example, we know that if we um, do something regularly, so say, for example, fasting, and we um, engender good habits during the month of Ramadan, because these habits are practiced every day for a series of days, 30 to 40 days, the habit then becomes part of you and part of virtue. And there is evidence to support this. So if, for example, every day you make a conscious effort to... to say grateful things, to be grateful, um, then if you keep practicing it, initially it might feel a bit awkward or not natural, but eventually if you keep practicing it day after day after day, it becomes you. And actually your whole outlook to life changes. Um, and there are little tips and tricks. For example, I do something with my children every day in the car. At the end of the school day, I'll say, what three good things happened today? Not only do I get to know my children better, because my son might mention academic achievements, my daughter might mention connections with people, you learn to become more grateful generally. So this is an example of how you can nurture different virtues, and there's many of them um, that we need to work on. The thing about phronesis is it's actually called a master virtue because it's, an, it's got an executive function where, for example, where, where things conflict. So you might have the conflict between... Um, being kind to somebody and being honest. So, for example, if you ask your husband, do I look fat in this? He may say, he might tell you the truth, um, or he might just be kind to you. And actually the wisdom is knowing what to say and when to say it and how to say it to you, knowing you, if that makes any sense. Um, I don't have any other questions coming up on the chat box, uh, so I'm assuming that we don't have any other questions from the attendees. Uh, let me just double check that I haven't missed any question. Um, right, so we've got um, a question from Sister Fatima Fazal. And she's asked, how important has the support of your spouse been to allow you to achieve what you have done so far? To all the, So she's asked to all the panel. And how can we get our spouses to be understanding and more supportive about our career aspirations? Um, Mrs. Wasti or Mrs. Uh, Dr. Jamil, Dr. Abdukhair. I think let Samara go first. Mrs. Wasti, thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, so sorry, just repeat the question again for me. Um, so, Sister Fatima has asked, how important has the support of your spouse been to allow you to achieve what you have done so far? And uh, how can we get our spouses to be understanding and more supportive about our career aspirations? 
Um, <laughs> very tricky question. I would say that regarding what I've done so far, uh, alhamdulillah, my husband's been very supportive, and um, you do need an extremely supportive, understanding husband to help you move along with things that you want to do. Um, so um, how can you win his support? At the end of the day, I suppose it's as long as you're fulfilling his needs and his requirements and the rest is really, you know, that's the way around it. So um, an and open communication and uh, if you make him your priority and he feels that he's your priority, then I can't really see how he would, you know, not be happy about you doing something a little bit for yourself that will help you all as a family to flourish, really, be it Islamic studies or be it your career or be it, you know, but. Uh, also, um, you know, if you involve people in what you're doing, they're obviously more um, compliant and happy with what you're doing. May I contribute? Sure. Okay, so when I when I got married, my husband and my background are slightly different culturally. Um, so one thing we needed to get clear is the difference between the cultural um, stereotypes and requirements within a marriage and the Islamic ones. And subhanAllah, the fact that there is so much good um, literature out there to help us about what our roles and responsibilities are as a husband and as a wife, I think really helped us focus on the Islamic duties rather than some of the diluted cultural stuff. So that, that for me was a key and once we found our common ground with that, that was the basis of, of moving forward. Um, Alhamdulillah, my husband respects my profession, he's not medical, um, he is in fact in Islamic banking, um, so that helps that he respects my, my role as well. He's very, very busy himself and I think he thinks as long as I can keep um, the house running, the kids happy, um, the food on the table, then, alhamdulillah, um, I think things work okay. While we are on this point, Dr. Jameel, um, uh, we, have a quite, uh, we have a question. Um, that did you used to fit cooking and cleaning into your weekly daily routine when, when the children were very young? Um, and I will ask it to the other panel members as well. I think I did and mention it before, but then my wife said, yeah, I, I, from the very beginning, when I had young children, I decided I was going to in, invest in a, a regular cleaner, and I, again, have no regrets, so even to this day, I have regular cleaners that come to my house and help me with the cleaning. Um, Cooking-wise, though, I do do that, um, and I try and do it every day, because my husband likes fresh food. Um, it's important to plan in advance, at sort of four or five days in advance, what you're going to cook so that you know what you're going to buy and how long it's going to take you to prepare things. So I may actually um, cook Asian style food two or three times a week. Um, other days I might just put in a lasagna or something. And, and like I said before, mashallah, my 14 year old daughter, she makes a, a wicked salmon bake. So um, getting the kids to help with chores as well definitely um, has, has helped. Great, Marshall. Well, um, there has been a question um, from one of the attendees, Sister Zina Umraji, um, and she's asking, um, do either of you know any sisters that are not GPs and how have they managed with their families and training? I think Sorry, I should... the question, do I know any... I think I yeah, yeah. So Aisha, Aisha, she's just done all the training, uh, but she's not a GP. <laughs> I think she's asking Sabina generally a question: if there is anyone you know who has done the, all the training, hospital training, and they're not GPs, but they are carrying on their profession. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think there are certain professions which are maybe more, more accommodating to um, women who want children. I think paediatrics is probably one of those. Um, your training does obviously take a lot longer, um, but it's a really important person, a really important aspect of being a whole person that understands people and patients. Um, so we should never feel ashamed or guilty about taking time off to have children. Um, but Dr. Jamil, um the, the people who are interested in other uh, specialities, um, and they, there has been a question whether 
um, there are any opinions on having children a bit more late in training. I mean, um, what do people feel about that? I mean, there's a general trend, but as um, obviously if we've got our own values as Muslims, and this question um, keeps um, keeps coming up in our heads. Will um, is it a good thing to actually delay your children because you want to pursue in your um, in your busy careers? I mean, how, I what, really what is interesting, interesting regarding some? Well, we plan and Allah plans. So there will be those families, those couples who really want children and can't have them. Um, and I actually um, decided to try and to try for pregnancy after I knew all my hospital on calls had finished. Um, and alhamdulillah, um, that happened. So I'd finished all my on calls. I was in my GP post when I had my first child. But I can um, imagine how difficult it must be when you've got a young baby and you have to do overnight on calls. Um, and the issues to do with, but I want to breastfeed, um, who will look after my child. So there are huge challenges. And I think I'll just go back to what somebody said earlier, is that make dua, do the best you can. Everybody's circumstances are different. Yeah, sure. Sabina, I will uh, add it to your point. Uh, to be, um, in my During my training, I had my children, we were like, alhamdulillah, I had a maternity leave. But uh, always think about, uh, you know, even if you have to do, um, um, have to have a maternity leave without any kind of statutory prayer and all those kind of things. I think this is an, it should be a separate webinar to discuss about these things. We as a female doctors has, alhamdulillah, so many rights and uh, uh, we should be really grateful. And uh, I was supposed to start my GP training and my son was only nine months and I was actually breastfeeding him and I really wanted to carry on. I, I requested them that could be delayed and they and to allow me to come back part time, so they did not allow me to come back as a part time, but they did delay my, uh, you know, the start of the uh, time of the training. So Alhamdulillah, so I won in one way, and another side is then I was just a GP this time, and my do youngest daughter was born, and I was doing all my exams, all my AKT, MRC, GP, uh, you know, the CSA final with her. So that was a big challenge, but Alhamdulillah, having said that, at that phase, I did invest on the cleaner. I didn't have anything at the end of the month with me, but <laughs> Alhamdulillah, uh, it was a big investment, and now I will really enjoy that time once if I have finished my training. Same for the hospital training, if you are doing it. I think there's, there's no an issue, investing issue on the that, uh, again, another sister raised earlier about feeling guilty. Please, please, with the sisters listening, be kind to yourself. Really important. Yeah. Don't yeah. start having these feelings of, I'm not a good mom, I'm not a good doctor really not constructive in, in helping. Just be kind to yourself and know your limits and think, I'm feeling a bit stressed now. I think I need to um, change something. Change something but be kind to yourself and don't keep beating yourself up. And once you have learned how to look after yourself, then inshallah things will fall into place. And that does mean sometimes saying, no, I'm not going to take on more work, I'm not going to do locums. Just just look after you as well. It's really important. Uh, I'm just mindful of the time, um, and uh, well, I've just got a one. We've got two more questions, and then inshallah uh, we'll wrap the session up. Um, so we've got a question from my sister Aisha Wardak, and she's asked, um, "How have you overcome cultural stereotypes of being a mother and working, especially if one of your social circles?" Sorry, I lost the question. They just only want you to be a yeah. housewife so, and daughter. Yeah, <laughs> so especially one of your social circles are mothers who have never worked or gone out to uni and see the sole purpose of being a woman is to be a good mother and a wife and a daughter-in-law. So how do we overcome these stereotypes? I'm happy to answer again, but I think I've spoken too much. Does somebody well, have to me, talk to me? Um, I think Mrs. Wasi has just left. Uh, so we have left with you and Dr. Abdul Khair, really. Oh, OK. I think, again, um, I make dua every single time I do salah to be a good wife, mother, daughter, sister, doctor, friend, woman, mujahid, Muslim. Um, Associate Dean, I, it's just a big mouthful of, of things that I want to strive at and, in, and be good at, inshallah. Um, Stereotypes-wise, 
I think, I think have some confidence in yourself. You're not there to fulfill other people's stereotypes of you. You are the best person to be you. And, and you have a different path from the person next to you. So just do your best for good purposes, with good character, and have a little bit of thick skin to, oh, you should be wearing a sari today, and this and that, and cultural stereotypes. Just, just do the best you can with good intention. Uh, yeah, that's really true, Sabina. And uh, just add on to it, uh, Aisha, I, I would actually say, Alhamdulillah, yeah, we do come across these sort of people, but be proud of yourself. And my, my, Alhamdulillah, you're not wasting your time. Set your priority. Your priority is to serve the community, inspire other people, and make them like you who are not wasting time. They're multitasking, and but they're still helping the community. They're serving the humanity. And Alhamdulillah, our goal is higher up rather than just to be... And Alhamdulillah, we are not making our family, we're not ignoring them. We are trying to serve our husband as well and be a good wife, be a good mom as well. So just keep everybody together and keep them on board with you that the way and keep on educating them as well. Because many, one of other sisters, she has uh, sent me a personal question. And then, you know, there are certain cultural problems, hurdles in our way sometimes. Uh, we do uh, come across many criticisms from the family around or something like that. But inshallah, think what's right for you. Go part time, take things easy and uh, slowly. And inshallah, Allah will be there to help us and keep asking Allah. Definitely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our uh, main helper. And we can't do anything without relying on Him. And inshallah, back to Sabita, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Are you there, Savita? Sorry, I just realized Hi. my mic was on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I was just checking if we uh, we have answered all the questions. Um, there was there was a question I missed earlier. Somebody has asked some advice about um, um, about sh time, screen time for for young children, um, and how do um, because obviously when we are working. Um, we tend to give our tablets and laptops uh, to our children in the evening because we are so busy with our uh, with our stuff. Um, how do you guys manage with um, limiting t screen time for for your young children? Any tips, Doctor Amtukhe? Um Kids' screen time. I don't have a TV in my home. <laughs> That's the main thing which has really helped me all over. Uh, you know, during my all, all this time when, when I have the children, alhamdulillah, after one year of our marriage, me and my husband decided not to have a big screen. Okay, we do have a small screen, but limited time, and that's only uh, allowed after, as a reward when they have done their work or memorized a chapter of the Quran or something, have understood, or they have worked it together. So, alhamdulillah, uh, yeah, uh, let the kids run around you in the kitchen or when you're cleaning or tidying up, make them to do it with you, as Sister Savina was saying it and involve them as much as you can and give them small chores according to their age and capability and inshallah they will be your helpers rather than uh, and, and 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 do explain them they, there's a you know different stages when they really get attached to these they want a separate time and make sure you have a big bookshelf at your home or in their bedrooms or somewhere and uh, and and give them a vitamin and it means learn how to say no to their desires don't like you know the Xbox and all those kind of things. I'm not saying don't buy them at all, but fix the time. And if you can discipline them, if they can discipline themselves, so inshallah, that just it's okay to have it. So none of the uh, you know these um, kind of old uh, modern te uh, technology. It is not bad. It's the use and you know the discipline of your own nuts is important. Jazakallah khair, Doctor. I agree. I, 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 yes, please go on, Doctor. Completely with teenagers as well. I, I tell them that social media and the internet is an amazing tool for learning um, yeah. and that it's your choice as to how you use this, but please use it for good use, not wasting time on looking at photographs and taking selfies. Um, as for my little one who's six, I have to admit, um, when I'm cooking, he does help me do a few chores, but then when he gets a little bored, I know this sounds strange, but I actually prefer him watching TV to being on a tablet because I can pop in, I know exactly what he's watching, 
Whereas on a tablet, they can just press onto other little links and, and they can go on some very inappropriate links, even if you've got parental blocks. So I, I do admit, I, I prefer him watching a program that I know what he's watching than just browsing on a little tablet. Very much right. Mm, so let's just take a last question and then inshallah we'll wrap up the session. Um, there's a question from Sister Fatima Iqbal um, and she, she's asked, how do we cope with childcare if both, um, if both of the parents are working and, the ex and there's no extended family um, available to look after the children? I think, um, I'm not sure, Dr. Amta Khair, I think she, she had a few challenges when uh, she was in training. Am I right, Dr. Amta Khair? With regards to child care. Not, yes, you're right. I think the good child care is is uh, the child the child minder if you respect your values. Um, yeah, I I was a bit lucky when I came to Manchester. I had a quite a few with my own uh, like faith and the agreeing with me. Um, she had the same sort of values, the way I wanted my children to be fed and look after. And uh, yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah, it's hard. It's hard to choose, but you have to keep on trying. Nurseries are not bad. Uh, but again, you have to see what you like and what you prefer where your child is better looked after. If, yeah. I, if I was to contribute, I would say from very early on, I was willing to pay extra for what I believed was excellent childcare um, because I could not go to work feeling worried or anxious about what's happening to my child. So as a result, um, they, I put them in expensive nurseries um, and got a lot of feedback and in some occasions when my children were really small, I would go to the nursery to breastfeed them at lunchtime. So I didn't mind paying the extra. I was also, mashallah, so blessed to have a really lovely mother-in-law who, who actually passed away of cancer this year. Um, she was amazing and she used to collect the kids. Um, I never really um, used lots of different providers because I think my kids needed the stability of making bonds with a carer or somebody in their nursery rather than this babysitter, that babysitter. So I, I did always want them to have continuity as well. Um, I do have GP trainees um, who I'm responsible for who actually have nannies. So nannies that can come really early in the morning and sometimes stay until quite late at night if they're doing out of hours or on calls. So again, that's something to consider, um, but again, it's personal choice as well. Yes, I think this is one of the most difficult decisions that we, we have to make as mothers when we are working, where to leave our children. Um, and um, definitely, um, I'm, I'm sure... Sabita, uh, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Hello. He's talking. Yes. Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum as Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was just saying that this is one of the Salam most difficult decisions. Yes, Dr. Jamil, we can hear you. Were you trying to add something? Dr. Abdukhair, can you hear me? No, no, it's fine. Yes. Right. I was just saying that this is one of the most difficult decisions um, about finding a good childcare. Um, and um, personally, um, I have been struggling a lot uh, with childcare, especially with uh, when you don't have really have any, any family around. Um, but um, the session was really, really encouraging in a way that um, it reassures you that there's so many people out there um, just like you. And um, this, um, this session, um, it really offers encouragement and suggestions for, for making motherhood and medicine work. So I'm really thankful um, um, for, uh, on behalf of Viva, Dr. Jamil, um, that, um, for, your, for your time with the, on this Can session. Yes, yeah, sure, please go on. I, I promised I would mention something really very important. That Sorry, um, your voice is breaking down a bit, Dr. Amin. Hello? 
yeah, there was just something really um, that I found most valuable, and that's as sisters, we can help each other. I have other sisters um, who work, and when they're struggling to do the school run, I'll do it for them, and vice versa. Please find your community of sisters that can help you as well, because that's what we're here for, to help each other. Yes, great. This is a really, uh, this is indeed very useful to, to have like-minded individuals around you who can help you out um, with your daily stuff. Um, inshallah, um, we, will, um, we will continue to work on this topic and we've got some projects in mind um, that will inshallah help the trainees um, to be better mothers and inshallah while they, uh, while they are in the field of um, medicine and uh, healthcare. Um, I think if, uh, for me this session was really um, encouraging in a way that um, we can see that many people are finding ways to get through these grilling years um, of training with, with families. Um, and we can eventually, we can just pray to Allah in the end that uh, may Allah equip us with the resources, um, uh, the character traits and, and, and uh, behavior that is required to perform the, I would say, the world's most important